the conflict in Northern Ireland has a complicated history. Um, I was, you know, I was a big kid. During my sort of later secondary school years, lost a lot of weight. Oh, he is sinful. I, um, that, you know, you, you're going to hell. And, and, you know, that's something that I've heard quite often during my time in secondary school after I came out. You know, right. losing friendships, all of this, you know, it will do that to you. Sort of formally send my resignation. These developments that I'm not liking, the, the you know, the, clique, the cliqueism, the backroom dealing, people exchanging favours. <laughs> the, 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 a lot has happened in the union over the course of the last couple yeah, of weeks. Which, again, quite I, serious things happen. But um, at the fundamental level, a society should be governed according to its governing doctrine. <laughs> if I can sort of summarise it, <laughs> a lot of bloodshed. Um, on both sides, um, people. Hopefully, I haven't um, sold myself short. Yeah. Space is it's taking up a lot of my time at the moment. Future of humanity, dear, with nothing <laughs> less. Um, Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to my podcast, Coffee Summy David Kwan, where I strive to give guests legacy worthy interviews that listeners can enjoy while cooking, commuting, relaxing, or walking their pets. This is a sensitive period in the life of Cambridge, particularly concerning student politics and elections, but coffee is helping my guest and I. Um, we are approaching 10,000 podcast downloads, and if you have been enjoying the discussions on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts, thank you firstly and first and foremost, and please do consider leaving a review and nominating a guest by contacting me via my link tree, David Kwan. For those new to the podcast, welcome and thank you in advance for your engagement. Please know that I don't take your time and feedback for granted because when I started this podcast at a low point of my time in Cambridge, <laughs> I was mostly nervous about humiliating myself. But I went ahead with this passion project based on three ideals that still make up the content description for each episode. First, a purpose of giving. Second, learning from others. And third, sharing of stories. I will be the first to admit my many, many inadequacies, and I'll certainly listen back to laugh at how naive I am. But I, said, uh, but I genuinely do maintain the deep conviction that this passion project, if wholly true to those founding motivations about giving, learning and sharing, is a worthwhile pursuit. Seeing this podcast on people's Spotify raps or receiving positive messages about the guests do make me smile. I cannot thank all the guests enough for their courage and insights. For now, I'm excited to host a, uh, my guest, David Eagleson. David is a final year law student who served as vice president of the Cambridge Union Society for a year until his recent resignation, which cited a rise in cliqueism and a decline in membership value as his reasons for resigning. He's now standing to be president of the Cambridge Union Society. Before coming to Cambridge, David had an interesting upbringing in rural Northern Ireland. David is currently writing a dissertation on public international space law, and in his free time, he undertakes research into space law and policy with the Space Generation Advisory Council, which has permanent observer status on the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. David, welcome to my podcast, Coffees on me, David Conn. Thank you so much for having me, David. Great to see you again. <laughs> I understand this is a difficult period, and the elephant in the room is that you are amiss your presidential campaign for the Cambridge Union. Um, we will get a chance to talk about the union, but if you don't mind, um, could we start somewhere not at the union? Yes. No, I'd, I'd, I'd like that. Wonderful. <laughs> We've obviously um, both spent a lot of time in the union and worked together, but um, we'll get to that. But you mentioned you had an interesting upbringing in rural Northern Ireland. Yes. Go for it. So where I grew up in Northern Ireland, so I, I grew up in a place, um, a, a tiny hamlet, um, several miles outside the nearest town. Um, in, in County Tyrone in Northern Ireland, sort of central Northern Ireland. And the community there was really quite insular, quite close-minded. Um, you didn't really get much of an opportunity to socialise beyond sort of those living in the village and, and, you know, a couple of surrounding villages. That was the extent of social life for the people living there. Um... And, you know, my growing up, my primary school was, um, you know, in the village itself. It was only several hundred metres from the, the front door of my house to the primary school. Um, and then, you know, when it got to sort of the stage of going to secondary school, I went to um, 
the same school that my parents went to. Um, it's called the Rainy. Um, it's, it's based in Macrofelt, which is not the town that I live near. Um, it's took me a 30 minute drive every day to get there. Um, but my parents were really, really keen for me to go to that school because you know, obviously with the, the history of conflict and tension that there is in Northern Ireland, the Rainy has a culture of cross community learning with sort of you know, Protestants and Catholics um, you know, nationalists and unionists learning together in the same space. No matter what background you came from, you were in some ways made to feel quite welcome there. I, there are other ways in which I found you to the culture that, that that wasn't necessarily the case for me and I can get on to that. But on the whole, there was this shared experience, this shared culture that sort of pulled us together and that, that was a spirit that the school had practiced for 300 years. It had a 300 year history um, of teaching Protestant and Catholic students together in the one place. What are you? Um, so my family background is, is Protestant, uh, my religion is, is, is sort of Protestantism. Um, I, my family, uh, we've always, um, well for a long time, my family has belonged to the Church of Ireland, um, so obviously Anglican faith. Um, but it was it was learning in a shared environment that really sort of opened my eyes to the conflict in Northern Ireland, to seeing sort of having friends who'd grown up in that same village as me, who didn't have that same experience at secondary school, who went to schools that were much more insular, that didn't have that cross community feel. Their whole outlook on the conflict in Northern Ireland was was quite confrontational, really. They, you can see why educating people in that sort of environment wouldn't be conducive to building a lasting peace. And my only hope is that, that more people in Northern Ireland actually get a chance to experience the education that I did. Um, I'm incredibly fortunate for it. Um, it's one of the things that I think will always stand with me. You've always been very passionate about the conflict in Ireland. And I was wondering, just for people who don't really understand the conflict, could you maybe give a one to two minute overview, just a quick <laughs> overview. <laughs> you're, ask, you're asking a lot there, David. It's, the conflict in Northern Ireland has a complicated history. Um, obviously, the entire island of Ireland used to be part of the United Kingdom. Um, but during the 20th century, the Republic of Ireland acquired independence, first as the Free State, then as the Republic of Ireland. And... Um, the United Kingdom held on to this, this group, this collection of, of six counties that make up Northern Ireland um, to this day, um, just in, in, in the northern region of the island of Ireland. And yeah, that led to a lot of bloodshed on, on both sides, people who wanted those six counties to reunite with um, the newly sort of as they saw it, liberated republic, um, leaving the UK behind, and, and those sort of unionists on the other hand who wanted these six counties to be a bastion of sort of Protestantism and to remain with the United Kingdom where they sort of felt that their faith and their culture would be protected. And the divide can run quite deep. In, 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 in certain communities in Northern Ireland to this day, the divide still runs very, very deep. And that can still have violent outbursts. Um, I've had neighbours who have been murdered. Um, you know, even even in recent years, uh, growing up through primary school, I had I had several neighbours um, who who fell victim to the conflict. And so it's still something that's very much alive. That's still very much going on to this day. And growing up, whilst it, I certainly nowhere near as bad as my parents had it growing up in Northern Ireland, but. Seeing that sort of violence, that sort of conflict all around you, I think, I think that's what made me determined to, especially, especially given the, the education I'd had um, at the secondary level in a sort of cross-community environment where I was interacting with people who didn't have that same political outlook that I had. Right? My upbringing gave me a very unionist outlook, but I was, I was every day I was learning with students who'd grown up in a nationalist background, um, they wanted to see a united Ireland within their lifetime. We didn't agree on those political issues, but we could still work constructively together. Um, 
And so it's avoiding conflict and, and, and seeking out connection and dialogue with those who you don't necessarily agree, agree with that I think has driven me to this day. Um, it's the reason I wanted to go beyond Northern Ireland um, for my university level education. Um, most people in my secondary school went on to study um, at universities in Northern Ireland. Uh, we have two, um, but I, I didn't apply to any universities in Northern Ireland. I was determined I wanted to get away, seek new experiences, meet new people. I don't agree with all of them. Um, I, don't, I certainly <laughs> don't agree with everyone I've met in Cambridge. Um, but it's continuing in that dialogue and that discussion with those people who you don't necessarily agree with. That's what I still seek out to this day. Um, and that's something that was imprinted on me during my secondary school education. I'm sorry to hear about all the conflicts and all that kind of stuff that you got to witness as a kid. So would you say that like a, a typical childhood in Northern Ireland is filled with a lot of fear and uncertainty then? I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that someone's entire childhood is filled with, with fear and uncertainty. It, it's certainly the case that you'll, you know, you'll grow up watching the news, you'll see things like, you know, bomb scares, murders. Um, you, you, you'll see sometimes, um, you know, in certain parts of Northern Ireland, still very active paramilitary activity. You know, men walking through the streets quite openly wearing balaclavas and carrying guns. Um, I suppose that is quite terrifying. So um, at what point do kids feel like they need to be able to basically articulate what they believe in the divide, if at all? Well, I think for a lot of children growing up in Northern Ireland, it's, it's imprinted on them at home, you know. Um, people in Northern Ireland have a very... A very strong sense of culture and identity, um, whether that be you know unionist culture uh, or or nationalist culture and identity. And I guess if you don't have exposure to the other side, you become very insular very quickly, and and you immediately know, mm. um, maybe not necessarily what you would have thought yourself had you grown up in a more sort of free and open environment, but. You certainly know what's expected of you by you by your you know by your parents by your family, um, by those living in even even your local village, mm. um, and I, I'm I'm very glad that I had the chance to sort of you know grow up in quite a free and open environment. You know, learning with those as I say who who didn't share the same opinions as me. It meant that you know whilst I know what I believe on the issues. I can still engage with people from the other side. I don't, you know, whereas someone who didn't have that might become more and more insular, might turn to that violence. I think that's what has kept it going over the years. So if we think about the culture of your kind of secondary school, Rainy and Dowd, uh, grammar school, where you talk about this cross-community collaboration, the openness about debate, was it very much like very politically driven discussions like did that feel like lunch times and recess and like discussions or did you also get a normal childhood you know where i think outside of northern ireland and I, you know i don't want to make northern ireland sound like this sort of place where you know I, I, as i've said you know there's still some violence culture is you know there's a real strong sense of culture and identity mm. And I think because that's what the media picks up and that's what's going out there, mm. people outside Northern Ireland especially have this view that that is Northern Ireland. That's what it's all about. I actually um, think about conflict. like Seamus Heaney and yeah, <laughs> no, good things. Oh, yeah, 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 no, exactly. <laughs> and um, yeah, I actually, you know, I went to school near where um, Heaney. Seamus Heaney grew up and oh. where, he, where he wrote his poetry. Mm. Um, you know, Macra Phelps, where I went yes. to school is, you know, several miles from, from Balaki. Um, yeah, which is yeah, Seamus Heaney land. <laughs> um, but oh gosh, where was I? Um, okay, well I guess let's focus on some non-political stuff then. Um, I remember when we um, used to have a lot of chats in the union. Mm. Um, you kind of shared a little bit about your fitness journey and the progressions that you've made there. Would you like to maybe elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah. Um, so growing up. Um, I was, you know, I was a big kid. I was quite, I was quite heavy. Um, I, during my sort of later secondary school years, lost a lot of weight. 
I, I don't want to sort of, you know, give numbers or, or anything, but it, it, was, it was substantial. Mm. Um, I, I realised that, you know, the way that I was was going to have quite a significant impact on my health. And I was determined to, to make a change to that. And I, I, I did, I committed to it. Um, one, of, one of the scares that I'd had actually was, um, you, know, I, you know, I was doing some, what you might call quite light exercise one day. And um, <laughs> the next thing I ended up in, uh, in the doctor's surgery. And, and you know, um, I, I just, my arms had, had collapsed on. And the, the doctor, suspected that what had happened was I'd had a mini stroke. Wow. Um, and, you know, for someone at a young age, that, that's quite mm-hmm. a terrifying thing to have mm-hmm. happen to you. Um, and that, you know, combined with everything else, that, I, you know, I was conscious of the fact that, you know, as an asthmatic, that it was going to have an impact on my health in that way. It's what really drove me to make the change, to lose the weight and to sort of make more conscious, sort of healthier life choices. Um, I'm definitely, yeah, I'm definitely doing a lot better now. My health has improved. Who was a part of your main support network when you made those changes and how did you go about (laughs) implementing them? Yeah. Um, So, you know, it's sort of a very close friend who... Um, was in the same year as me as, uh, as me at school. Um, right, we both just got talking on lunch. We decided, okay, we're going, we're going to do this together. We're going to support each other. So we just signed up to our local gym, started going quite casually at first, just, you know, trying to get into the habit of doing it. But then we bumped into um, this guy. He was, he was a few years um, older than us. And um, he he'd, had gone to the same school as us, but he, he'd become a personal trainer. And he decided to, you know, give us some pointers, point us in the right direction. And I guess the two of them really did form my core support network. You know, the fact that they were, you know, willing to reach out, willing to provide assistance. I think that's what everyone needs at the end of the day is that that support network. Those people who are willing to, you know, sit with them to work through whatever it is that they're finding difficult. Um, you know, you, you can't go through all of these things on your own. You need that support network around you. You've got quite a reputation, obviously, at Cambridge. Um, but what kind of reputation did you have in high school? So, my secondary school, I was sort of, you know, I suppose it goes for a lot of people in, here in Cambridge. You're sort of known <laughs> as one of those sort of studious kids who... <laughs> You know, sits in the front of the classroom, asks a load of questions, mm. um, you know, <laughs> uh, performs best on tests. That was, that was certainly one aspect of my, my experience um, of secondary school. But there, there, there was another side to it, especially after I, I came out. And, and this goes to the heart, I guess, of what I was saying earlier in terms of that inclusive cross-community environment, that sort of real sense of community that I felt in the school um, that sort of bridged the unionist-nationalist divide didn't extend to me in every single way. Um, A lot of people, um, you know, in Northern Ireland and and in the school that I went to especially were incredibly religious. yeah, I'm quite religious myself, but you know that a lot of people in my school were sort of ultra religious. Um, you know, believe that you know homosexuality is sinful. Um, that you know you're, you're going to hell, and and you know that's something that I've heard quite often during my time in secondary school. After I came out uh, from my peers, I lost a lot of close friends just because school, of coming out just because of coming out um and did they just it, ignore you or were they actively they criticizing you actively couldn't support it um yeah yeah and um you know it's it's i think it's a sort of toxicity which it it, it extends to um the community in Northern Ireland as a whole. I think, 
you know, obviously there are going to be religious differences in, in people's outlook and what they view as, as right and wrong, but I think you can still treat other people with a, a basic level of, of dignity and respect. Um, I, I remember, um, would have been a year, maybe two after I'd come out, I was, um, I was at the Belfast Pride event um, in Northern Ireland, uh, one of Northern Ireland's only Pride events. Uh, my own sort of local town has only, um, in the last couple of years, actually started holding its, its own Pride event. Very small, always attracts a huge protest. But this was at the Belfast Pride event. I was one of the first times that I'd actually held hands with my first boyfriend in public. We were just a couple of streets away from the main parade. And I just remember feeling incredibly unsafe. Wow. And to, to be honest, to be honest, um, due to, you know, the protests and the yelling and what I've been told for my, you know, entire upbringing, a little bit ashamed, you know, but a lifetime of hearing, you know, that it's wrong, you know, losing friendships, all of this, it, you know, it will do that to you. Mm. Um, it will really grind you down. And, you know, you're taught, I think, growing up gay in Northern Ireland, to a certain extent, um, obviously, I, you know, perhaps, um, if, you know, growing up in a, in a larger city is a bit better, but I think you're taught to hide yourself away. Partly because, you know, you fear there's going to be some personal danger to yourself and partly because of the sort of culture. It's, it's not accepted. Um, I mean, in, in, in the time that I went to secondary school in Macrofelt, um, there was a community centre that was set up, that was harassing some of the only um, gay couples who lived in the, the local area. Um, you know, there were stories that you'd hear of people getting phone calls from the centre because they had, you know, because the centre had found out that these people were living openly gay relationships and they'd call them up, post leaflets through their, through their letterbox, telling them to, to con you know, to go through some sort of conversion therapy to change. And um, yeah, so the, the culture in Northern Ireland really is teaching people that this is something to be ashamed of. And I just didn't feel like I could live my sort of completely free, open self um, back there. Things have got a lot better, but it, it, it was one of the driving factors in me wanting to leave Northern Ireland for my university level education. So you said you're religious mm. and obviously with coming out um, that there's a lot of kind of um, controversy around that. How did you personally reconcile the religious text and scripture with your mm. decisions and your actions? Mm. Um, it took me a while, I can't lie. Um, I'm not, you know, ultra... Sorry, I'm still not sure. <laughs> Siri, Siri popping off. I'm not. I'm not ultra religious. I go. I don't go to church. Um, admittedly, I don't go to church every single week. I go semi regularly. Um, but religion still has quite an impact on my upbringing. My my grandmother was incredibly religious. Um, and um, I I remember. On one particular occasion, there was um, a minister from the church visiting our house. And um, there, there, there was talk at the time about legislation being brought in to um, sort of legalise um, same-sex marriage in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And I remember my grandmother saying that she was, you know, quite frustrated with this. And the minister just openly agreeing with her. They were... They were Obviously, I wasn't, I wasn't out at the time. My family didn't know. That, that hit quite hard. And that, you know, the minister then providing sort of religious justifications for why, why this was wrong, why this, this shouldn't be happening. Um, given that that was my own religion, that I was, you know, growing up with, that I was, had this internal battle myself trying to sort of figure out how I could reconcile the two, that had a deep impact. But ultimately, I think at the end of the day, um, for those who, who are religious, 
the realization that you know God has made every one, single one of us in His vision um, has you know everything planned out. That that is the real driving factor behind um, reconciling reconciling the two. I'm not a theologian myself, but I nor I, am I. I, I <laughs> but I, I went to an. Anglican school, you know, our school motto is mm. pro dea patria for God and country and you know, the the kind of religious ceremonies yeah. and the values have influenced me quite heavily and actually one of the most um impactful moments of my schooling when it comes to religious teaching is that our chaplain actually openly backed same sex marriage mm. and he argued that voting yes is actually in line with Jesus' teaching. Um, so I think in his kind of newsletter, he talked about how like young yeah. people more easily connect to Christianity through like social justice issue, and mm. it shares kind of Jesus's mm. passion for justice and equality for all. Yeah, and you know Jesus reserved his like harshest criticisms for those religious leaders who excluded people from the faith because of their so called uncleanness. And I think it was in that context of Jesus's concern for those mm. who are marginalized and excluded that he argued that if you are religious, then you can vote yes to marriage equality if that's what your conscience yeah. is telling you. So I found that to be really just... like just an warm. interesting way of putting it, yeah. Because I think he, he mentioned about like, mar- like marriage is a commitment to love and mm. cherish each other. That's what the fundamental it is. Precisely. And in the context of a stable society, right, which same-sex couples already have children it's almost like a, it could arguably be a positive step and you know the argument that somehow that diminishes like heterosexual marriages mm. just seems to be or, or he argued that it didn't seem to make a lot of sense um yeah i, I mean Absolutely. yeah when i think about the concept of marriage like it's probably changed for the better you know shifting from like property inheritance and to, to more like mutual respect and love. And yeah. I was wondering, had you thought about it not being either or, but actually because you follow Jesus, you can treat others with respect and follow the golden rule. Have you thought about that? Absolutely. I think, I think religion and sort of Christianity does form part of, of the reason um, why I wish to you know, treat everyone that I meet in life with, with dignity and respect. I think everyone should be given the benefit of the benefit of the diet and i think that you should do your best to, to reconcile your differences with everyone where possible um but i don't think that religion should be used as a tool to prevent others from from living life as they see fit and as their conscience tells them it, it is the right way for them to live their life um and in Northern Ireland, unfortunately, people do people do use religion to try and, mm. um, you know, oppose things like same sex marriage. I mean, it, it, we see it all over the world. But I to take the example in in my school, my secondary school, um, a few of us banded together. We tried to create a um, sort of a a gay straight alliance of sorts, a, a sort of club in which people could come together. We could, we could be open about our experiences and, um, you know, when we were feeling, we could, we could be a support network um, mm-hmm. for each other. The school rejected the idea of, right. of having um, anything like that. Um, and, um, yeah, that had a bit of an impact. I mean, n- naturally, I'm, I'm still very glad that I had that network of, mm. of people that I met through school um, and we were able to support each other. I mean, you know... <laughs> Um, three people in my friendship group came out within a year mm. um, and you know a great support network for one another um, to this day mm. um, but it's it's finding if you've had a religious upbringing in Northern Ireland and at the same time you've grown up gay I think it's finding a space in which you can practice religion in an open environment a lot of religious institutions in Northern Ireland are quite opposed to worshipping with gay people. And even if the sort of main body of the church says that's not the case, I think it's important to recognise that in, in the smaller communities, in individual churches, 
because that small community in itself is quite resistant mm. to change, is quite resistant to what they perceive to be outsiders, to those who don't conform to the mould of what they see as the way to live life. Those individual <laughs> churches themselves are quite mm. resistant to it, even if the sort of leadership of the church is trying to move things forward in a positive direction. Mm. And so change is coming, change is happening all the time, but I think Northern Ireland is going to take a while longer to catch up. Have you found, uh, do you feel like you found that community now? I think I have, I think I have. I think since coming to Cambridge, um, you know, I've, I've been able to live, live my life in a much more open and honest way. Um, you know, I haven't had to hide who I am at all. Um, you know, in, 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 any, in any situation, um, I I've, I've just haven't felt the need to. Whereas in Northern Ireland, I was always conscious if this person were to know, how would they feel? And would I be welcome here? Would I be welcome in this space? No, no matter what it was, no matter what the situation was, I found myself in. Because myself in. Um, culture, religion, identity, they all form such a core... Mm part of who people are mm. um, in Northern Ireland. Do you mind if we move on yes. to the union? Oh, the big topic, the big topic. <laughs> so I guess my maybe positionality, um, I'm not here to endorse anybody. And for someone like, I, I ran for president this time last year, as you know, and yeah. you, you didn't back me at the time, which is fine. Um, no, 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 that's fine. Because um, uh, for me, it's not a personal thing. Like you, you, you choose the candidate, but I, I guess I, I ask the question as someone who has obviously been through the process and have seen kind of the inside at the most extreme level. Yeah. And I, I can wholeheartedly say that <coughs> even though I haven't lived a parallel life, that life now is great for me and I, I yeah. really enjoy it and I really appreciate the people who I got to meet through the union and all that I've learned from it. Um, and I understand it's a stressful period at the moment, but where would you like to start? Ooh, where, <laughs> where would I like to start? I, I mean, yeah, I, can, I completely agree with you, David. I've made some absolutely incredible friends for life through the union. Um, I think I'll, 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 go, I'll go back to, I think, to my decisions for joining the union in the first place. I joined the union um, in my first year, um, became actively involved in the, in the Easter of 2021. I think sort of, you know, we, during my first year, several COVID lockdowns, my, my reasons for getting involved were I just remember going on, you know, I, I, you know, obviously went to some of the online events, but I just wasn't feeling that community atmosphere. And when I was thinking for things that I could do, places I could go, societies I could participate in, mm -hmm. where I'd have the chance to meet the most people from, you know, the most diverse range of backgrounds, studying a wide range of subjects. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously law society wasn't giving me that. It was, you know, it was full of lawyers. It was just like, just like my course. It was just like sitting in supervisions, you know, even mooting and stuff. Whilst it's that sort of different social aspect of the course, I think it's nice to meet people who are studying different things and bring a different perspective. And the union is a place where you get to, to interact with people um, you know, who study anything and everything. Um, for sure. I think, like, for me, the union has been one of the biggest parts of my university life. And it's interesting because simultaneously, I think, joining and participating and giving my all to the union mm -hmm. was one of the best things, but also one of the best things was losing my campaign after working so hard and I'd, I think I needed both <coughs> to like who I am is formed by both of them and yeah. I guess a, the elephant in the room against that backdrop of you joining the union is now the other half of you mm. as vice president resigning from the union yeah um, a few days ago you posted your resignation letter in public and I did. just for the people who've not um, seen it. I'm just going to read it out and maybe we can work from here. So you wrote to the president, I've been actively involved on committee at the Cambridge Union Society for six terms now and I thoroughly enjoyed the time I have spent here. 
Taking on the vice presidency was a huge step in my union career, but I have thoroughly enjoyed it and until recently was supported by a friendly and inclusive atmosphere in which I felt I could accomplish my best work. However, recent events have given me immense cause for concern and pause for thought as to my involvement on the present committee. This is in spite of some of the wonderful events you have put on. We've known each other for a long time through this society and you've taken on the presidency in your own unique style. This has not been an easy decision to reach, but I cannot condone an environment in which deceit, backroom dealing and rumour spreading prevail at the expense of the delivery of high quality events for the membership and the facilitation of our charitable work. Despite repeated attempts to stand up for transparency and constitutional due processes, these efforts have been made largely in vain. I therefore feel compelled to declare my resignation as Vice President of the Cambridge Union Society. Change is needed to return the union to a position from which it can maximise value to its membership. This will require the defeat of cliqueism through openness and transparency and a renewed commitment to deliver on the promises we make. It will require an active and concerted effort, but a better union is possible, one in which everyone can feel able to participate, no matter their background. So, you're in a contested <laughs> presidential race now. Yeah. What made you resign as VP? So, yeah, you just read out my resignation letter. <laughs> um, I, you know, as you say, I, I resigned on Thursday. It, it took me a while. Um, in light of so that's several a... weeks of mm. experiencing the sorts of, the sorts of issues that I sort of refer to in my resignation letter, it wasn't an easy decision to reach at all. It was a very, very difficult email to draft, and even more difficult email to send um you know i you know warned um the president that i was going to do it but even still i remember you know having to sort of formally send my resignation and sitting there and you know sitting there with my finger over the send button it it wasn't easy to send but i think fundamentally the union has changed in in the ways that i sort of felt compelled to draw attention to for the worse from the union that I joined in my first year. The union that I joined in my first year had a very open and inclusive atmosphere. It, It was a union that I very much felt I could get involved in. Um, and that, you know, I was, you know, speaking to people who were around the building, who were on the committee, he very much, you know, took me under my wing and, and, and you know, showed me the ropes. Um, and he you know, pointed me in the directions of, of how to get involved. I mean, even, you know, a bit more recently, you think of, you know, David, you're a how to get involved guide and sort of ensuring that there's this sort of open atmosphere, that it's not closed off, that people don't feel like, you need to, to know someone or you need to have an in or you need to owe someone a favour in order to, to get something or to actively become involved. Um, and I think, you know, and I, I, I can't go into the details surrounding my sort of concerns around the following of constitutional due process. I'm, I, I, I can't disclose the specifics on that. But what I would say is that I think the membership are entitled to expect their society to be run in the way that is outlined in its governance documents. I think that goes to openness and transparency and and to giving people what they expect. If you depart from fair processes which are set out in the constitution, you know, if people aren't giving, given a, you know, a fair shot, a fair chance, um, according to the rules that are outlined, you very quickly get to the position where you, you know, where, where cliqueism and sort of this sort of ruling class can sort of really be, be fostered and really be entrenched. Um, and people pay a lot of money to be part of the union. They should be able to get actively involved. They should be able to 
read the Constitution, read the How to Get Involved Guide, and the ways in which they can get involved should, should reflect that. You know, if there's an interview process, it should be fair, it should be open, it should be done according to the processes set out. So the contrast that you have noted is very clear. When you joined, you used the words like a friendly and inclusive atmosphere, and now it's about deceit, backroom dealing, and rumour spreading. Do you think the union culture has fundamentally changed that much in the past year, or is it because the deeper you got involved, you actually now amiss something that was always there? So, I... There's probably an element of that. I, I've been vice president for a year now, so I've been near the top of what's been what's been going on in the union. Um, you know, sec- second in command, as someone put it to me recently. I, I don't know if I go that far. I think the union is a, is a team. But I think the way in which the union is run sort of changes on a, on a termly basis. Um, you know, each new president brings their own... Um, unique style, I think, because I even referenced in my, <laughs> my resignation letter. I, you know, Christopher and I, um, the current president, we, we go back a long time in the union. We yep. work together very closely, mm. um, you know, sharing an office during this term. <laughs> um, but he, he gave me one of my first starts in the union working in the events That's management true. department whenever he was heading that, heading that department. Yep. And um, it's one of the things that made resigning during this term that bit more difficult but you know he's, he's put on a good term there have been a, a good series of events um, and I've been I've been glad to help with that but it's these it's these other things that I'm seeing these these developments that I'm not liking the, the you know the clique the cliqueism the backroom dealing people exchanging favours and you know to a certain extent this sort of thing has probably always gone on in the mm. union in student societies but when you're paying, you know, such a large sum of money, over two hundred pounds, to be part of an organisation, I don't think it should be ruled by that sort of behaviour. I think you're entitled to expect a higher level of propriety from people who are responsible for overseeing an organisation like that. You know, it's not just a sort of student society you can join for a few pounds at a social. <laughs> you know. For a lot of people, signing up for union membership is a huge commitment. And um, yeah, it's important that it's run to, to the highest of standards and that the environment just doesn't become toxic. And, and unfortunately, at the moment, I feel that's the direction it's moving in. Again, I feel like it's my obligation to challenge you. And before I challenge you further, I think it's worthwhile to note that there's no doubt that you... And also um, the other presidential candidate, Max, uh, 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 have both worked incredibly hard and devoted significant time to the union. And I think it's okay Absolutely. to acknowledge the efforts and the care and concern you have for the institution. I, I mean, the deceit, backroom dealing and rumour spreading that you talked about. Every campaign, people raise this as an issue and propose that they are the ones who will fix it. How do you even address this? Like, I, I just don't, like, personally, I just don't think this is something that one person can solve. And, you know, like, from the outside, and it's hard to, I guess, imagine an election season and how much stress it puts on people with campaign teams and political parties or lawyers involved. Like, mm-hmm. for me, having gone through it, it was such an eye-opening experience of the gossip and the rumour and... I, I mean, even in my campaign, I feel like there was a lot of mm. this kind of stuff. But my, my my question to you is, do you honestly claim that it is possible to avoid or eradicate this? So I think the first thing I'd like to do, I think, is to differentiate slightly my my resignation from my campaign. Okay. Resign, resigning is one thing. Um, running to try and change things. Should is, we stick with your resignation another, for let's now? Let's stick with the resignation. Okay, let's do that. And is it is it possible to fix it? I I think I think it is David, but I think it's okay. So it's that's baby steps. It's maybe if we stick to your resignation. So you notice no, 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 this? The, yeah. Okay. The, the resignation. If I sort of the issues which I highlight, you're asking me 
if it's possible to fix those. Okay. Is it? Is that, okay. Is that, yeah. Sure. Is, that, is that what you wanted to know? Well, I guess like you you you, you pinpoint it, you see mm. it. I don't get why it causes a resignation. Like I, I say, like that's the question, not necessarily what I believe. I'm just saying, mm. giving you a chance to share your thoughts. But these kind of stuff have always been there. Why would you resign at this time? Like, surely you haven't noticed these <coughs> issues just at this past week. <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs> David, the, 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 a lot has happened in the union over the course of the last couple yeah, of weeks. Which, again, so, I don't know. Often. And I, I can't go into the details of everything due to sort of sure. duties of non and that. everything else. However, you know, some quite serious things happened. Um, I raised my concerns about these things. The constitution needs to be followed. Where the constitution is not being followed, I think that's the most that's the most basic level of propriety you can expect. Right? You know, forget cliqueism, forget all of this stuff that, that sits on top of it and might be driving, you know, sort of departures from constitutional due process. But at the fundamental level, a society should be governed according to its governing documents. And that's the basic level of what you can expect. And where that's not happening, and where that has, has led to you know, certain allegations or, you know, anything else, I th- that's, I, you know, I, David, I, I wish I could go into more, unfortunately, I can't. That's, that's really what prompted me to resign now. Um, yeah. I, I, I wish it's the sort of thing I could provide more, more context on. Um, I understand the, you know, mm. the, the desire to provide context and believe me, I, I, I want to give it, but, um, so I, I guess, okay. So that's a resignation then, mm. um, in terms of the, um, current campaign, um, you kind of mentioned like the, the three themes of your manifesto include transparency, membership value, and accessibility. Um, you've had six terms of experience in the union, and uh, again, both you and the other candidate, Max, have achieved a lot in the union. And I, again, I, I respect both of you tremendously for the hard work that you have put in on the committee. I found this on the web. <laughs> yeah, I'm tempted to take off the watch at this point, David, to be honest. <laughs> your your <laughs> achievements are indeed on the website. <laughs> So, the voting base don't necessarily see all the behind the scenes work. What would you wish the voting base could see uh, in terms of something that they couldn't see? Maybe that's their achievement, maybe that's the work you've done, or your thinking process. I think the vice president is is very much a role that sort of, as you say, it flies behind the scenes. No, No one sees what the vice president does in the same way as, you know, a speaker's officer, a debate's officer, a president. Those roles that are sort of very publicly elected, you have to make very, you know, public pledges to the membership and then, you know, you're expected to deliver on those. The vice presidency is different. The vice presidency, it's appointed by the standing committee. It's a year-long appointment. Um, the membership see me every, every week, every Thursday, sitting... Taking minutes. Taking minutes... <laughs> I think for a lot of people, that's that's the rule. That's the idea they have. That's <laughs> what I do. You know, I'm not a speakers officer. So I'm not you know organising speakers events. I'm not a debates officer. So I'm not organising debates. But I think that to, to, the, the vice presidency that the taking the minutes at the desk is honestly the easiest <laughs> and simplest part. Of a vice president's role in the union. Get a nice debate at the end. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you're, you're doing most of the, the background admin. You're facilitating card transactions. You're helping, you know, book taxis, coordinate competitive debating events. Um, you know, you're, you're the point person, most importantly, for long-term projects in the union. Mm. You know, things that we've seen recently, like the, like the members' room, you know, carrying those projects along from president to president 
you know, who all have their so called unique vision. <laughs> they all have their unique vision, but when you commit to a long term project, and a lot of the key things that you need to do in the union are very long term commitments, you need to set them up right at the start and you need to make sure that they get carried through. You know, there's, there's a lot, yes, that you can achieve in eight weeks, but many more of the things that you want to do might take a year mm. to implement. And that's, I think that's the sad reality of life is that some changes do take a while to implement. But you need to set yourself up for success at the beginning and carry them through. The vice president's role is to carry them through. But I think serving as vice president, I can sort of see how things can be set up for success at the beginning. The, you know, the key things that you need to do. You need to set up, you know, clearly what it is that you want to achieve and how you're going to achieve it. Um, the members room was a project that a lot of thought went into. Uh, a lot of discussions were held, you know, between myself and, and various presidents about what they were coming into with their own unique vision, how they saw it, but also what had been done up until that point, you know, where this long-term project was. Um, so having been on this side of the long-term project, the appointed role, hypothetically, if you were president, what kind of, how, how would you leverage seeing this side to ensure a better working relationship. That doesn't always happen, right? Yeah. I think I've seen behind the scenes of several presidencies in a way in which no one else has. Um, you know, as I say, the vice president shares an office with the president. You know, there are two desks that sit in the office, they face, they face each other. Um, you interact with them, you get to sort of, you know, engage and, and Sometimes, you know, some constructive criticism, but really prove what it is they're doing, <laughs> why they want to do it, and how they're going to implement it. I, I've seen, you know, personal relationships, I won't give specific examples. I've seen some successes. I've seen some... Not so successful. Not so successes. <laughs> um, but you can see really how you go about implementing various policies and, and what you actually need to do it's unfortunate i think but i think it's a reality where you've got such a large committee like you do in the union committee politics can sometimes get in the way of the things that you want to do and it's a sad reality but it exists and it's there and yes again it's one of the things that i highlighted in my resignation letter you know politicking is getting in the way of increasing membership value everyone's thinking ahead and you know Perhaps I bring this from my experience as an appointed officer rather than sort of an elected officer. I didn't spend all my time thinking ahead to the next election. I was there for a year. And when you're committing such a long time of, you know, sort of your own student life to a place, you want it to be good. You want there to be big successes. But where everyone's thinking in these sort of eight-week chunks, you know, what am I going to get in the next eight weeks? Right? What am I going to have to stand on my next, my next platform um, for election? That's, that's dangerous. And it draws people on committee's attention away from where it needs to be. Um, and that's in what the membership wants. None of us are perfect. And I know even in my time, if I was to redo some things, I would do it differently. I'm not saying I regret it because we can never have full um, benefit and you know hindsight is great. So... If I was to further challenge you, can you not challenge what um, <laughs> what would you have done differently, or what mistakes would you be comfortable sharing that you have made, or what shortcomings or weaknesses do you personally have, <coughs> or are you just perfect? <laughs> <laughs> no one is perfect, David. No one is perfect. I think it's. Picking, picking just one, David, is, is, is always the task, isn't it? You can pick a few. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, and again, I understand it's campaign season, mm. so it's difficult um, with constitutional restraints and stuff, but... So yeah, if you were to retake... I, and sort of, you know, having been vice president, being bound by, you know, confidentiality on, on so sure. many things. I think, you know, sort of... 
there are times in which you can insist on constitutional due process is important, don't get me wrong. There are times in which perhaps you can go too far and, and you need a bit more flexibility baked into the society. And perhaps like, you know, I've always been an advocate for constitutional due process and committee and sort of, you know, doing things. Sometimes you need a bit more flexibility, um, not for the important things, not for the controversial things. Um, but sometimes you do. And, and perhaps I didn't always provide that flexibility. Um, you know, also worth bearing in mind that, you know, a law degree is, is, is quite busy. So whilst I'm very present, as you say, I'm always in the union building. <laughs> I, um, I feel that, you know, there, are, there certainly are times, I, I think anyone will find this, but a chemistry term is hectic. There are times whenever, you know, you want to be there and supporting a particular project, but you feel that you can. And that, you know, I wish I could have dedicated more to certain projects and you know there are certain things you know that have cropped up whenever I'm having you know, have a particular busy week you know four essays due sort of thing um yeah and I you know it's a shame you know being being a, you know my final year of my undergrad as well there's a there's a lot going on I think towards the end there was a lot to try and sort of mm. squash and there was a lot going on in the union there was also a lot going on with my degree and it, it's mm. trying to to balance the two sometimes you just want to go out of space right for you literally <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> sometimes sometimes it would be nice just to go and, and, and float out in space so you, you've always been interested in space more yeah do you want to just like that's quite a niche mm. interest although yeah. lots of kids would you know be fascinated by mm. it a lot, a lot of people are fascinated by space generally but, but space law I think you know, a lot of people say it is a bit more of a niche, and I, su- I suppose to an extent. Um, so, you know, everyone always asks me, why space law? How did you get into space law? Um, What's oh, at stake? David, you're always talking about space. What's at stake with space law? <sighs> so, future of humanity, did with nothing <laughs> less. Um, but no, uh, space law is all about, you know, sort of, as you'd expect, um, laws at an international level and at a national level which govern um, activities in or you know, also activities relating to space so it might be certain activities that happen on the ground you know, licences for launch facilities those sorts of things um, I'm mostly focused as you, know, you said in my bio it's the topic of my dissertation public international space law so you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the core UN space treaties you know Irish Space Treaty, um, the Moon Agreement, the Liability Convention, Rescue and Return Agreement, um, you know, those, you know, core UN treaties and also sort of, you know, multilateral agreements between various states. We look at now sort of US efforts with the Artemis Accords. Um, but I, th- I think your question is very broad, David, and sort of <laughs> <laughs> what is the issue in space? So I think it, it might What's perhaps a question? be more helpful if I talk about what, a little bit sort of what the issue is I'm exploring in my dissertation. Yep. Okay. Um, so I, I've decided to focus in on one particular issue um, <laughs> because there are, there are many. Um, you know, the one criticism that's often pointed at international law and, and one that I think is particularly prevalent in international space law is that it's largely written by you know, superpower states, particularly in the US. You, know, you think most <laughs> of the space activities that we see are conducted by the US. Most satellites in orbit are US controlled, right? So the fact of like that gives you a certain position from which you can you know, project your power and really control the direction of international law at the expense of smaller states, smaller nations, those nations that don't have a very active space programme as of yet. Very often those states that were the sort of victims of colonialism um, you know, have suffered at the hands of larger powers already. That had a lasting impact and they haven't got the resources to have this sort of thriving space programme. You know, we've, we've got a space programme in the UK, France has a space programme, Russia has a space programme. You know, these are, you know, 
former imperial farms. Um, the U.S. is a bit more of a complicated history, but you know you see that the way the U.S. acts on the international stage is still a very sort of dominant economic leverage over smaller nations. And so, what my dissertation is trying to explore is, <laughs> if I can sort of summarise it. <laughs> is the sort of impact and influence that these larger states have had on the development of international space law. And then to provide a solution for how smaller states can be given more of a say, more of a voice. And it's really balancing those interests, David, because you know, criticism that's going to come from the larger states like the US is, you know, they don't have an active space programme. They're not involved. This doesn't concern them. But I think if we want to be sustainable in our approach to outer space exploration. We need to be doing it for everyone. You know, everyone needs to be invited, everyone needs to be involved. We can't have, you know, this sort of land grab where the US is going out, acquiring all these resources, you know, tearing up the moon with sort of mining activities. And then nothing's left for anyone else. Um, so it's about balance. Um, and it's about creating governance structures which give everyone a fair shot. That's great. Well, David, this podcast is about, you know, giving you a legacy worthy interview, which <laughs> I consider like a meaningful piece of recording that you can look back <laughs> on in 10, 20 years time and that captures snapshot who you are. You've obviously achieved a lot. It's a sensitive period, etc. Is there anything else that you want to be featured in this recording or else I've got two final <coughs> concluding questions? As you say, David, it's, you know, it is a sensitive period. Um, I, obviously, there's much more that I wish I could share at this moment in time. And Do you think one um, day you would write all that in your autobiography? Maybe I would. I don't know, maybe you'll invite me back and copies on me for another, another <laughs> bonus episode when, when, I can, when I can finally Spill the tea. <laughs> oh, goodness me. Um, Anything else you want to share or else I've got two finals? I think I've, you know... We've, we've explored several different topics. Even gone out of space. Even gone to outer space. So <laughs> if, you want to, if you want to wrap up with your last two questions, I'm more than happy with that. So I guess second to last, what would you tell that big kid <laughs> that you were... <laughs> Using your words. Exactly. This is not yeah. my words. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is... So, so, so cliched, especially in the gay community. You know, it gets better. But it does. It, it truly, truly does. And with, you know, with effort and commitment. You know, if you put the effort in to get to where you want to get, you can get there. And um, the, the other thing I would say, which is um, it's also somewhat cliched, Find your passion. <laughs> Stick to it. You know, if, if your passion is public international space, law, <laughs> you pursue that. <laughs> Go get it. <laughs> and I guess final question would be, what are you still like personally scared about and how do you go about tackling your fears? That is, that is a deep question, David. Um, I think what I'm always most scared about is, is lost time. You know, everything I do, I'm like, is what I'm doing now? You know, whenever you've got so many different projects and so many different things that you're working on, it's, it's easy to wonder if you're spending time on the right thing. I, you, know, I, you know, I'm obviously working on, you know, space law. It's, it's taking up a lot of my time at the moment. And it is, a, it is a passion. It's been a passion for the long time, for a long time. But I guess I'm wondering if that's, you know, if that's where my future is. Like, yeah, I feel that way now. It's, it's, it's commitment, David. It's, you know, once you commit to a course and you dedicate so much time to it, you've, you've really got to stick with it. And so... I think for everyone at the university sort of level of their career, it's a very important time. You know, a lot of big decisions have to be made now. Um, 
you know, the thing, the, the decisions you make, the things you decide to focus on, you're setting yourself up for your career. And, um, you know, I'm happy with the choices I've made. Um, I hope that there are many more careers in public international space law <laughs> in the future. If not, I could be an unemployed lawyer with a passion for space, but time, only time will tell. Has the past hour been lost time? <laughs> The, the past hour has been good, David. It's been um, it's been wonderful to catch up. It's been uh, such a long time. You know, we haven't we haven't seen each other. You know, you've asked me to come on the podcast several times before, but you know, as VP, having that sort of <laughs> hectic lifestyle, it's, it's never been possible. I remember you sort of reaching out following my resignation to say, you know, it's now finding the time. Coffee's on me, and um, I'm I'm glad that. We got to do it. I think there, there's one particular thing that jumped out was um, on, on the application form you sent out to me. It said, um, you know, don't sell yourself short. I, you know, mm, mm. I'm 5'4". It's not, it's not the, <laughs> the easiest thing in the world. But um, hopefully I haven't um, sold myself short. And, you know, hopefully the listeners enjoy the, enjoy the podcast. Thank you so much. And I guess in terms of the sensitive period that I would just, again, I, I'm not publicly endorsing anyone. I respect both of you as individuals. I would just encourage any potential voters who are listening to examine the manifestos, listen to what the candidates have to say, focus on the full person, and let's not fall so low to attack people on a personal level, just re- reminding, just remembering that we're all humans and no one is um, perfect, not even Absolutely. the presidential candidates. Absolutely. And um, whatever happens, I wish you the best. I know I can speak from personal experience that <laughs> life doesn't end and there is a bigger world outside the union. And for you, there's always space to go to. <laughs> <laughs> always space. Thank you, David. Thank you.